Oh man, Bones, it's so good to have just me and you in the studio again for two straight weeks. Swain, I agree. It's just, a, it's been a nice, serious 1v1. We, what's up, guys? What the? Bootsy's back. How's it going? what I miss? Uh, it doesn't matter. You guys ready to do this? I know you've been missing <sighs> that birdsy energy. He's probably going to want to tell us about his trip or wherever the hell he went. <sighs> Seattle. Uh-huh. Very original. The Untamed Wilds. Anyways, uh, birds, actually, we've been taking it very seriously. Uh, we were very focused mm. last week. We did not do a lot uh-huh. of joking around. And I think people appreciated that. So- it's the most downloaded episode ever. <laughs> uh-huh. <sighs> oh, <woof>. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's fine. I can take constructive criticism, but, uh, wild card bitches. What do we got this week? Ugh. Actually, Andrew, uh, cut out that wild card bitches. I don't want to. No, leave this all in where he is confused about their, <laughs> whether or not he wants to be a douchebag. <laughs> <sighs> no, we, we, we got a, we got a chat up front. We got some topics. You know, I just got a, uh, I got a decent retold tale to drop. Um, the stats aren't like it's nothing special, but it just feels better. And, oh my God. So I talk about that, right? Uh, sure. Yeah. You can do that. Uh-huh. What are we, uh, what's, what's the intro? Are we starting it off? Swain, do you have any uh, notes or anything from this week? I, uh, hold on. Let me, let me, let me check real quick. Oh, hold on. So there's someone at the studio door. One second. Is that? Yeah, we're not ready just yet. How does he, how did he? Guys, it's, it's our guest. He's like, hold on. Yeah, no, we sort of like. We're 300 feet underground right now. That's the whole point of this. I mean, he yeah, is in the military. Guys, he's waving a bunch of notes at me. He's like banging on the door. I think we have to start oh. the interview. Oh, well, That's the rule. If you find us and get break into the studio, we have to go directly to an interview. There's nothing we can do. I'm sorry. Andrew, musical break. Now. 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 Heck yes, folks, we have got music this week yet again from Snow Burial, snowburial.bandcamp.com. Guess what? They just got themselves a record deal. So we're going to hear some new music coming down the pipe from them. Not too long, but for now, please enjoy their classic 2016 album and uh, check them out, snowburial.bandcamp.com. And hey, if you're a musician, we want to play it. It's simple as that. Crucible Radio at gmail.com. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Crucible Radio. We're here with our very special guest, his first time on the show. Uh, you might know him as the leader of the clan, Adept. Uh, he's very good and very good at making you good, too. Cap, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. That's good. That's good. All right. Well, this is what we do at the at the beginning of these things. We ask, who are you? What's uh, What's your video game history and why do you play Destiny? Yeah, where'd you come from? Sure, fair enough. <laughs> so uh, I started out kind of like most people do. You know, I've been listening to the show for a long time. Same continuity as everybody else. I started out in Halo. I was, you know, Halo Comet Evolve, land, having fun with my friends. Uh, and, and that actually got me into, once I got into high school, Halo 2 and kind of the Halo 3 scene, kind of played in some MLG. Played about six years as an MLG pro for a while um, with some teams down in Dallas, the Southwest Regional. Um, love that was a lot of fun, good experience, but then life kind of got real, um, graduated college, joined the military, been doing that ever since. Um, just loving that life. Lots of challenges keep me growing. Um, but to get back to gaming, yeah, I all started in Halo. You know, I've been playing shooters as far back as I can remember. Marathon, Dark Forces, Dark Forces 2, all that fun stuff, uh, way back in the day. Uh, but when Halo came out, it kind of 
really introduced me to um, a game that had a, a, some layers to it that you could really sink your teeth into and get better if you wanted to. And it wasn't just mm-hmm. about the time spent. It was about the mindset applied to it. And being a very competitive-minded person, I like to try to succeed and, and maximize and optimize and anything that I do. Uh, that really kind of kicked me off in the direction of wanting to be a pro and and pursue kind of a pro mindset in whatever I do. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm the best. I will be the first to tell you. You know, there are people that have better Twitch skills or better um, teamwork skills. There's people that do things better than me. Um, but I try to bring the best product to the table that I can. And kind of like Bones alluded to, I try to help bring other people's best product uh, to the table. That's what I do in the military. And I love it. So that's kind of a little bit about me and where I come from. Nice. Yeah. No, a lot of our guests say, uh, you know, it was all started with Halo. And I say the same thing, but a uh, few people take it to the level of playing MLG. So I imagine that puts you in a pretty good spot to naturally pick up Bungie's newest shooter and at least have those instincts and stuff like that. And that's the hardest part to uh, to learn. So uh, coincidentally, the hardest part to teach as well. Absolutely. Those are Those are the intangibles that people can pick up in time, but may never master. And everyone's kind of on their own individual skill wavelength. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's absolutely one of those things that you can seek to master in this game. I definitely notice in my own playing that, you know, there are times where I realize, like, Oh, I'm just running around and dying a bunch. And like, I guess this is fun, but like, no, there's more, there's more, get back to it. And like, I kind of get myself to that mindset where it's like, okay, focus, let's play clean. And, you know, I'm not dying so much. I'm, I'm starting to, you know, get in the zone. I'm starting to think ahead a little bit and then realizing, okay, I'm still somewhere in the middle of what I've sort of achieved before. There's definitely a, a, a whole nother headspace that I could get to. Um, and I think kind of that challenge, even if you've been there before, but kind of staying in there and staying fresh and kind of keeping your gameplay, not just about the Twitch skills, but all those other levels. Um, no, it gives, it gives a game like this longevity. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm, I think you probably teach me a couple of things to <laughs> get me back on that, uh, that winning streak there. Hey, that's the key. We all got stuff to learn. That's the yep. key. Yeah. Anytime you think you've plateaued, you've handicapped yourself. Yep. That's it. Well, tell me a little bit about your clan adept. Sure. So just a little bit of background of it. Um, started this summer. Um, we kind of formalized as the clan, but we really like to try to think of ourselves more as a community. And we've kind of rebranded ourselves as such as the adept community that happens to have a, de- a very active destiny clan within it. But kind of the whole concept behind it was we wanted to bring together good slayers, but great people. Um, that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to try to make a common ground because for me, I know a lot of, I know of a lot of people and I know a lot of people on PC um, that are of that, you know, that higher echelon of um, play and performance and whatnot. So I wanted to try to make a place where you could bring a newer gamer and a seasoned veteran to come together and to learn together. Uh, Cause there's really not that many spaces to do it. There's such a wide skill gap um, talking, you know, just very basic level of point and click and shoot the head versus of the far end of the spectrum where you've got, you know, setting up your key mapping, your binds, your sensitivity, your DPI, all those things. That's just one piece of it. And then how that translates to in-game uh, actual performance, um, there's just such a wide gap there. And so we wanted to try to make a place where anybody and everybody could come in at a certain skill level and get better, but also served as a home for some of those upper echelon players to continue to scrim internally and then take that out into comp or trials when it was there, when it comes back. Um, and, and to get better. So it's it's a home for anybody and everybody uh, as a community, but it's a clan for the few um, that want to really try to take it to that next level. Now you guys do a, a, a boot camp of sorts, and I actually attended one. And I believe I mentioned it on the show right after that had happened. Uh, but what goes down in that in those sessions and, and how does that sort of help adhere to everything you just said? Yeah. So the Scrim Boot Camp is kind of my formal way as clan leader because I don't have a ton of time because family and job, you know, those come first. But it's my formal way of really getting hands on with the people that attend. You know, we have a members, certain amount of members that are allowed to come in, the newer members of the clan, um, but also open to the community at large. And what really happens in there is we kind of sit around and talk just at the beginning and say, hey, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? This is usually where we spend the bulk of our time because a lot of people, uh, be, 
because it's a video game. Not everyone takes it seriously, but for somebody w- with my kind of mindset, I try to always go that next level. We usually spend a lot of the time just talking about what they do well, what they think they don't do well, and really trying to define where they're at in terms of their player profile. Um, there's several different aspects to that. You know, positionally, where do you see yourself on the map? You know, are you aggressive or passive? What's your loadout? Because that usually helps explain a little bit of what you like to do in the game. Uh, what's your level of callouts, or do you even know what callouts are? Kind of building that player profile lets me understand where we need to take that scrim boot camp. Because ultimately, what we want to get to is we want to get to this scrimming environment where everyone's a valuable part of a team. Because that's what it's all about. It's about being on a team. It's about maximizing your performance. Um, because you can put a great slayer in, and they'll do great things. But if you go against a good team, you're going to get shut down. It's about putting those people together and, and synergizing and achieving something that you couldn't individually. So all of that leads to that. Okay, how much are you, like when someone comes in, what sort of loadouts are you seeing on like a beginner that's just showing up for uh, your boot camp? And are you pushing them a little bit more towards what mm-hmm. is the meta? Or are you just kind of tailoring their style around the meta? This is a great discussion, and I know if 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 uh, if Cammy Cakes is listening, to this is he's very anti-meta. He makes his own meta, so I can kind of I chuckle a little bit because he excels with anything. Uh, but there is definitely a meta uh, coming from Halo Two, Halo Three, where there's set weapons and balances and whatnot. And also being a big fan, I grinded my way up to top 500 in Overwatch. You have to understand this thing called a meta. So to kind of break that down real quick before I answer your question, um, on PC especially right now. We're very much in a super energy meta. Last season was a recovery meta. Uh, you stacked as much recovery as you could. You had Worm Husk, Phoenix Dive, all these tools at your hands to keep you in the fight longer. Now, in this season, it's really all about super energy. It's about maximizing your exotics, your super mods, uh, staying alive to generate super energy in order to acquire that. And so a build that supports that is what's most common. And right now, shotgunning... Um, paired usually with a hand cannon, is definitely top of the meta. Um, Right below that, pulses are still very strong on many maps. Um, Those never really went away. Um, And then I'd say right along with that as well is a a balance between uh, sniping as well as unique weapons, such as a chaperone or something like that. Um, Those are unique all into themselves. So those kind of three categories I really see as making up I'd say 90% of the meta I see in comp, um, as well as internal descrims. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about, I, I, I'm fascinated by this idea that we're in a super meta. And so you mentioned, sure, right? Like, I want to get a lot of kills, I want to have super mods. But I mean, there's. it seems like there's there's a bit more to it. Like, if I really wanted to optimize my loadout for maximizing super energy, um, or my play style for that matter. Kind of w- walk me through what are all the different sort of things that contribute to that. So here's where we really kind of take a deep dive because you, you, you helped establish kind of the baseline. Okay, I stack X amount of super mods. I have certain type of, of exotic. I'll get this much mathematically more super energy. But there's so much more to it than that, especially in comp. You really have to understand playing your life. Much like in Overwatch and the damage stat, the longer you stay alive, the greater your damage is going to be. I love that stat in comp because it translates so well. It shows a true contribution to the team. You have to stay alive. To maximize your super energy potential, not only do you have to be there for the kills because you get a little bit off of assists, you get a lot more off of kills, but just the time staying alive. So loadouts right now that are popular that support that, um, assuming the five super mods, Dragon Shadow on Hunter, um, that evasion is huge because it does two things. One, it gets you out of line of fire, but two, it gives you a free third-person view, which in, which is crucial, and, and looking around those corners and setting up what you want to do next. Um, a lot of survivability in that situation. Another good one is transverse of steps for the Warlocks because that sprint and slide increase, same thing, gets you out of sticky situations bad, reloads your weapons for you, does a lot for you. Um, any exotic, any sort of loadout centered around keeping you alive longer is going to benefit that super energy meta, as well as maximizing kills. Um, and really, for each class, there's really only two or three, I would say, top-tier viable builds to support the 
absolute nth degree of super collection. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, it's not all about supers. You do have to have the gun skill. You do have to win the fights. Um, so you have to balance that out as well. So I wonder how you kind of deal with high risk, high reward scenarios when it comes to playing for your super. And let's just say mm-hmm. we're playing, you know, clash, right? There's, you know, there, there, there's not rounds. I don't have to worry about capturing a control point or, you know, having my, my ghost in a good place or anything like that. Um, and I have a situation where, okay, I want to stay alive as much as possible. I want to keep my uptime up. So I'm kind of constantly building that super, but at the same time, I've got my shotgun out. It's fully loaded. I got plenty of ammo and I see what could be a great push that I accept. I might die, but I feel like I feel good. I can pick up two kills, maybe three kills. Uh, if I really commit to it, I'm probably going to die in the process. Kind of what's the calculus there? Is it worth it to get those kills to kind of, you know, get the momentum going for my team, maybe generate an orb or two? Uh, or should I be thinking about, okay, it's good, it's a risk, but really I'm going to serve my team best by staying alive and not overcommitting? How do you balance those two things? So I think it's really interesting that you said, you know, picking a basic game mode like Clash. And why I said it's interesting is because it's kind of a misnomer because that is an objective game mode. It's hidden as just team deathmatch, but there are what I would call micro objectives involved uh, that a lot of people don't realize, such as maintaining map control. And map control is more than just A, B, or C. It's what we call in Halo points of domination. So what are the points of domination on a map that are key to you to retain and give you an advantage, but also key to deny to the enemy? So anytime that you can fight for or secure a point of domination, That takes precedence over being passive and preserving energy. The only time you should really be passive and preserving energy is if you lost somebody, you're setting up to wait for a heavy box or something, um, or you're regrouping and preparing to push. You ideally want to be in this constant state of push, um, always moving forward, always moving from one point of domination to the other so that you don't allow the other team to kind of Uh, reach some sort of a balance and equilibrium and able to fight back. You want to keep them off their game as much as possible. Um, And if that means you die, that's fine, because what you're doing is you're opening opportunities and angles for your teammates. Uh, That's always worth the trade. Anytime you can open up opportunities to set your um, left and rights up for success, you're going to be in a good spot. Um, As opposed to some people that I know that just dive in for the kills. That's great. (laughs) If your team's not ready for that collapse, as we call Mm -hmm. it, or that coordinated push, then really all you're doing is you're feeding. Um, I like to use a lot of MOBA analogies when I talk about high-level Destiny play because it's about resource management, map placement, communications, coordination. So much what you see in Overwatch or in Dota, it doesn't apply necessarily to the macro game of Destiny, but the micro game of Destiny is absolutely a battle of resources. Who has what ammo? Who has what abilities on or off cooldown? Who's in what position to push here or there? Um, so there's a lot more to it than that. And, and I, I think it's great that you mentioned Clash because really Clash is a perfect example of micro objectives, points of domination, um, resource management, because whoever rotates the best, and by rotate, I mean whoever moves around from point of domination to point of domination and slays will win as opposed to sitting back and trying to preserve super energy. So um, you gave us topics. We're going to have to revisit a lot of these. Sure. Um, But I want to zoom back out to this boot camp. And I think actually it would be curious to hear um, Bones from you. I mean, you you attended one of these boot camps. Um, When you were first coming in and you were answering these questions of what's my preferred loadout, what's my play style, what do I think my, my strong suits are and what are my weaknesses what answers did you give for those questions oh wow yeah that was um it was like right off the bat just it's it's kind of funny because you know i can i can throw down in this game it's not like i'm bad but that experience was like a way to reevaluate my approach in such a different level so when i was thinking about that and especially with the other guys giving answers and stuff like that like i know i'm not a fast player you know, I need to work on my reaction speed, but I, I'm not the first person into the fight. I'm not the push leader. I'm not the 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 aggro slayer. So I was saying that, yeah, so like I'm, I sort of play 
more positionally. You know, I want to be in the right spot. I want to know when power is spawning. I want to be uh, on the angles to, to help get cleanup kills and make sure that I'm not just stuck off in 1v1s getting, you know, or getting swarmed by the team and separated from my from my team. So that immediately, uh, Cap was, you labeled as a, a control player, not the game mode, but just a control as a, a player who controls a zone, who, who knows where the flow of the game is going. Uh, and isn't, and then the slayers take over the the role of pushing in and and full on attack, and that was great because you know I'm using Luna's and a shotgun, the same thing, and my build is is as meta as I can make it because that's how I like to play. But it gave me a different purpose for using that. And then when we moved on to scrims, I felt like I fit into a team on a different level because I've scrimmed before, and I've played in tournaments before, but. Previously, it's like, okay, it's just four good people trying to beat four good people. Everyone try to do the best. But when you have like a purpose and a play style and a loadout that fits you, you you just work better <laughs> because you're doing things with purpose rather than just abstractly, I hope I win. So let's, I mean, let's, let's dive in there. I love this idea that there are kind of these distinct identities for different types of players, more than just the loadout that you use. Um, you know, Bones, you mentioned, you know, realizing you were a control player. Cap, can you kind of walk us through what are the major archetypes of players? Sure. So I, I think on your typical team, and I'll kind of zoom back out to my Halo days, you know, terminology varies. There was, it was the Wild West back then. There was no Halo League. It was just groups of good players that said, we're going to form a team and we made our own call out. So these are by no means universal. So this this kind of lingo and what not is more unique to my situation, but we kind of had four distinct archetypes, if you will. So you can't, you have your slayers. Those are very obvious. I liken those to a DPS in a, in like a wow scenario or MOBA game, you have your DPS, you have your slayers. They're the guys that are going to go secure the kills and get the job done to the highest degree while maintaining their lives. Then you have control players. Control players are the guys that are, are moving to points of domination and securing them allowing the slayers to transition throughout the map to get to their kills. A great example of this is the B capture point on Endless Veil. Vale. That is a crucial point of domination. So uh, having a good control player who prioritizes playing their life, but territory control, um, secure that area and locking it down, gives you five, what we call in the army, avenues of approach to attack the enemy. You can swing back through your spawn. You can go all the way wide right through their spawn. You can cut two through the middle uh, on either left or right cubby, or you can go right up the middle and go down to toilet and start pushing left or right from there. So already having a control player like that can really open it up. Um, you have to have a shot caller. That's the third one. And that's a tough one because that person has to be engaged in their own gameplay, but at the same time be able to look at what's going on in the macro game and make the calls. It might be right, it might be wrong, but at the best advice I've ever heard given by any of my coaches was better to be wrong together as a team and do it together than try to be right mm. individually because there's mm. greater degree for error to occur when you're performing individually, even if it's the right thing to do, than if you're performing the wrong decision, but together. Um, and then the last one really is kind of just what you call the swing player. It's somebody that can rotate between any of those. Those are great to have. Um, typically it means that that individual is slightly less skilled at one role or the other. Um, but I have several folks in our clan that can literally fill every role well, but like any competitive setting, it helps to have those that specialize in those three distinct roles, uh, to really maximize that performance, if that makes sense. Okay. So, uh, we've identified the shot caller as a, a special responsibility that, that somebody's going to take on. Looking though at you know a control player versus a slayer, do you see those as kind of like an axis? So you have like a very static, very kind of rooted, positionally dominant player on one side, and someone who's rolling around the map slaying on the other side, and then you you sort of have everything in between, and you know players move from side to side, um, mm -hmm. and sort of swing player sits in the middle. I mean, would you say that's a way to characterize it, or am I oversimplifying? I think there's a bit of an open simplification there. I think what we all need to understand for our own individual, like wherever you peg yourself as your skill level, you have to understand that there's a continuum, right? There's this spectrum of skill, both for you individually 
and for everybody else in the game as a whole. So, for instance, Bones. Bones is kind of downplaying his ability now, being a little bit humble. He's a very good player. <laughs> let me put and let me put this plug out there real quick. To be a 1.6 in survival countdown in the comp playlist on PC is hard. It is very hard because PC is very sweaty. The player base is not large, and the only people that are really committed to playing are very strong players or above average players. You don't really see a lot of learning folks on PC. So he's downplaying himself a little bit. He's a very good player. But I'll use him (laughs) as an example. He is a aggressive control player. And what I mean by that is he is at points of domination, whether he knows that he is or not, he's at them. And he's engaging in the fight. He's not sitting back just holding that zone. He's trying to find an angle. He's trying to constantly push up to that next point while not losing what he's holding. And those people are great because they are what I like to call rolling thunder, if you will. That's what we call artillery in the army. It's one of its nicknames is rolling thunder. They're constantly moving around the map at a slower rate of speed, but at a more controlled pace. So you can count on those people to be there for the fight while still holding, for instance, on Javelin. You know, the jump up right next to Heavy Box, uh, right off, off of the silo, that's a great example. You know, I remember playing Bones one time using his infamous Polaris Lance. He was, <laughs> he was on the Heavy Box, and his team was pushing up into B spawn, um, and he was fighting from the outside Heavy Box, and he was just slowly moving forward to and from cover, got on to jump up, and made it impossible for me to pick up the Heavy. He delayed us so bad that his team was finally able to flank around, even those bunch of randoms, flank around and wipe us. And so what that forced us to do was we had to isolate Bones, eliminate him, and then that opened up his team to being slayed. So a good, a good aggressive control player is always moving up and, and fighting, preparing to fight for that next fight. A passive control player is hanging back, just trying to hold what they have, um, and letting someone else kind of do that for them, if that makes sense. Sure. Are there different skills that are emphasized between a control player versus a slayer? There are. Um, I would say that it, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody because sure. I've seen people be a great control player with a shotgun. I've seen people be phenomenal control players with a sniper. So I think there is a, some obviously some variance there. But a lot of it's map dependent. A lot of it's team comp dependent. For instance, on um, a good example is Burnout. Burnout, it's really hard to snipe on. But if you have someone that's really, really skilled, because that box is basically a Sudoku puzzle. It's nine smaller cubes hmm. inside one large cube. If you have somebody that's a great sniper, just thinking about it you know, mathematically, that's five of the nine cubes, if you're in the right spot, that you can lock down. That's very powerful. Uh, by the same token, you can give a shotgun to somebody and they can make someone trying to push in that cube impossible. Um, it, it just depends on that person. So I think, yeah. you, I, think you emphasize, I think you emphasize somebody that knows when and where to, to control. And that's, that's a hard thing to define. Um, sure. But, it, but it's, a, it's a mindset piece. It's not so much a skill piece or a weapon piece. It's a mindset piece that defines the control player. So okay, so we've done uh, we've done introductions. We've started to get a sense of who we are, players. What's the next thing that happens at boot camp? Yeah, so after that, we kind of boot up a couple of matches, and the really emphasis there is not to win. You know, Bob Knight had this great quote: "The desire to win is easy, but the will to prepare to win that's hard." And I love that quote. I I try to use that in my everyday job with the army as well as to my gaming. You have to be able to prepare to win, and that looks very different. How we prepare to win is a skill that not a lot of people have, and that's what we try to build and adapt in our scrim boot camp. So we'll run a couple matches where we are playing for the sake of exposing our weaknesses Mm. and downplaying our strengths so that we can see what's going to make us better. Because if the goal is we come out of that and we can minimize our weaknesses, we can maximize our strengths and really achieve the pinnacle of what our current performance cap is um so we kind of do that for a couple matches and after that we'll kind of move just to a free-flowing scrim and the objective of that is to win with everything we've acquired but it's still in good fun it's not an egoing that we record it that we save results for people to learn and and go back from and view later um 
the, the baseline is everybody has to be willing to learn. There are some matches, and I, I would consider myself a good player. Um, there are some matches where I do well. There's some where I don't. And I have to sit back and say, why did I not do as well? Or did the other team just play phenomenally well? When we played BSK a couple of times in our comp grind, we were just going to try to get 60% of whatever their score was. And, <laughs> and that was what we were trying to achieve. Um, but that's because we know ourselves, we know our ability, um, and we're, we're trying to make appropriate benchmarks for us to reach. So let's say, um, you know, let's say we, we, we've got, you know, a more junior player, someone who's, you know, has got some chops, is pretty handy. Maybe he's got a, you know, a, a, a positive quick play KD. Um, they come in, they have, uh, you know, a couple rounds and they're getting crushed. What, I mean, you know, every case is going to be different, but for that kind of player, when you're trying to kind of get those good foundations established for them, what kind of stuff are you, are you working on there? What are you focusing on? I think the biggest thing right off the bat is you just you want to build confidence in their shot. You know, it's it's a shooter at the end of the day, so you need to be able to shoot. So finding helping them find a loadout because most of them don't even know what a loadout is. They're just using whatever looks cool or whatever has some some fun perks on it. You know, something they've used kind of in quick play before to some success. Um, but making helping them make conscientious decisions about what they're using, then helping them to get better with their loadout is crucial. Um, and really just trying to get their shot down. Because if they, if they can't shoot anything, all these comms, all these things really don't mean a whole heck of a lot um, going forward. So we really just try to get them comfortable. We try to just open scrim, free form, try to pair them with stronger players so that they can be active in more gunfights before they get killed or the gunfight's over um, before we really try to take it to the next level. But I try to... One thing I try to pride myself on is building that player profile on somebody before they even come in. So I, I, I've played with every member in Adept before they joined the clan, some, some more than others because of time availability. But even members in the community, I try to play with as many people as possible um, so that I, I know where their baseline is at. I also then know where their baseline with me is at. Um, and that's critical information. So I, I try to not bring anybody that's brand spanking new, but if they were we'd focus on the shooting first um, before we start layering on all this other stuff. Okay. Um, you know, we're hitting headshots. We can shoot. What comes next? So you're, hit, you're hitting headshots. Now it's hitting headshots at the right time while informing your team about it. Because what that'll allow to do is follow on plays. And this is really the, the, the next step after what you're asking is we're starting to play chess, not checkers. Now we're starting to ask ourselves what, after I win this gunfight, what am I going to do to win the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth gunfights? Especially in comp. That, that is the mindset of an elite player. What do I need to do to win the follow-on gunfights? For instance, Javelin. You spawned at A, you wipe them at B, you have your control player hanging back towards A so that they don't flip spawns, and you know they're going to spawn in C. How are you going to win that fight at C? Then knowing you're going to win that fight at C, how are you then going to get back to B pick up heavy, and fight them at A, and so on and so forth. And the team that's more disciplined about maintaining that continuum, that momentum, that rotation around the map, that's really kind of the ultimate level you grow into. So shooting, teamwork, communications, timing of engagements, and that ultimate level of thinking ahead to multiple engagements down the road is kind of where I would see the large chunks of the continuum at. Okay, we got to take one minute here in the middle of the show to give a word from our wonderful sponsor this week. What would it look like if we all listened more? Listening to audiobooks motivates us, inspires us, even brings us closer together. There's no better place to listen than Audible because now Audible members get even more. Exclusive audio fitness programs, audiobooks, Audible originals, and more. It's the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now with the originals, the selection has gotten even more custom. Every month, Audible members get one credit, good for any audiobook they choose, plus two Audible originals from a changing selection they can't get anywhere else. They also get access to the audio fitness and the health workouts created exclusively for Audible. Plus, your books are yours to keep. You can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. Didn't like your audiobook? Exchange it. No questions. Y'all know I love to... I love to read. I love getting into new books. I've got a pair of books you gotta check out. Uh, one of them, classic sci-fi by the 
author Theodore Sturgeon with a name like that, you know it's got to be good. But I just read the book More Than Human out of nowhere. And uh, hey, if you want to appreciate it, you want to appreciate it from your He's more car, than human. Maybe you're on your commute. He's a sturgeon. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, but maybe you want something a little more modern. You want some modern, cutting-edge sci-fi that's really going to blow your mind. I started this this one so many times, and then I made it past the first 10 pages. I couldn't stop. N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth series. Oh, my Lord. The fifth season is the first book of it. Uh, get yourself into it and uh, enjoy the ride. It's a, it's a fun one. Is the M in M.K. mackerel? It is uh, N. K. Jemison, oh. which is short for Nackerel. <laughs> Anyways, start your 30-day trial and your first audiobook is free. Go to audible.com slash crucible or text crucible to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash C-R-U-C-I-B-L-E or text crucible to 500-500. You can do it with audiobooks. And mackerel. And mackerels. I think if somebody digs far enough back into the archives of the show in the early days, I remember kind of having that revelation on air of going from winning a gunfight and you know, kind of celebrating, right? Like, hey, I did it. I got some kills. Oh, my God, I'm still alive. I did it. <laughs> to learning, hey, that's great. I want but to. We got work to do. You got you to keep going. And <laughs> yeah, right? And, and getting to the, like, I think, I mean, I don't remember the specifics, but I think I... I, I remember sort of that transition of thinking only about, well, not even about the next fight, just finding myself in it, to thinking about the fight that I'm in and how to win it, to thinking about the fight and then as it finishes going for the next one, and then chaining more and more together until it just becomes sort of a continuous process of saying, mm -hmm. what am I doing now? Okay, what am I doing next? What's the decision I have to make? And I found that, I mean, a lot of it comes down to you know, I can do so well in a certain fight, but the decisions I make between fights s sometimes seem like they have a bigger impact because Absolutely. they're setting up the, the next fight instead of just, you know, it happens and I start shooting where I stand. I can't tell you how many, how many team fights I've lost because I decided to reload at the wrong time. Oh, yeah. Or I decided <laughs> to peak just one more time, just one more time. I can't, I can't tell you how many fights I've lost because of that. That's like so perfect, especially like I had a big learning moment during that boot camp. And birds, you you hit on it perfectly. Like I remember that moment early on, year one, of when I finally saw the map as a whole and where people were on it. And it went from, okay, I just got a couple kills because I'm great at shotgunning now. Let's just hold sprint until the next red pops up on my radar. To okay, I just got a couple kills but I know where I'm going to go next and I know where people are going to pop up. So I'm going to go over here or I'm going to flank them this way. And like, I remember that big change in my game where it wasn't just hold forward until I found someone else to shoot with. But then in the scrims, I learned, I learned the timing of that. I know where they're going to show up. I'm I, and, and sometimes it's also easy to guess once you learn what spawns are, but then when should you go there? So there was at one point, and I'm really focusing on my control play. We're on Endless Veil. You know, I'm like hanging, holding on to that B zone. And I would, you know, lock down that point, would be nice and clear. And then I'm the one reloading and teammates are flying off to go finish the last two kills. So there's one point I was in the middle and I had, and, and I think, you know, the other three of my teammates are going towards A flag or whatever. And I had a radar pop up on C. And so I called it out and I was so ready. I'm like, guys, I know what I'm doing here. They're spawning on C. They're at C. And I just went over there. And I got melted by three people on C. Because I, I remember this happening. <laughs> I, cl I clipped it. it. Oh. <laughs> I was so far away from my team. I was in the zone. I had the PowerPoint on the map. And I walked over there and I got destroyed. And I was like, oh, oh, that's right. I forgot. We all have to go as a team. But that step, then that patience of like, all right, cool. We just got a nice team wipe. Let's all chill. Let's reload for a little bit. Let's regroup. And then we'll go to the middle. And it was like the next step up. And I was like, yeah, okay, now I see. But it really helps when you realize you think you did something good. And then four people shoot you in the head at the same time. <laughs> it helps. So, so Cap, talk me through that. Um, I mean, in, in particular, just yeah, how quickly how he got melted. But more generally, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I'm looking at it right now. I'm in, it's hurting my soul. Sorry, what's your question? Uh, so if, if um, yeah, so if I'm staying behind on B, the rest mm-hmm. of my team is rolling through to A, um, you know, looking for some action, and I get that radar ping on C, and I call it out. I'm standing smack dab on the middle of B, uh, and I know they're going to start pushing towards me. I've got a couple seconds to kind of make a decision because uh, I don't want to lose B, right? I don't want to run away even though I'm outnumbered and just give up that position. What's what's the decision I'm making in that moment? It's a little bit different because in in a scrim setting, there's no heavy and you're playing clash. In comp, there will be heavy and there could be a control point. But in a scrim setting, it's better to give up that piece of terrain mm-hmm. and rejoin your team and fight together than it is to try and retain it by yourself. Especially against a good team of three, you will get avalanched. What's better is to get to the what we call the pivot point in an engagement. Get to that place right before the engagement's going to start and, again, serve as that gateway for your slayers to rotate through. What that means is that you are going to be first to the fight, but your teammates are coming up right behind you. For example, like just the, just as you jump up a toilet and you're looking out towards beyond endless veil, that lane right there is a great spot if your team's rotating up from either A or C to B at. And, and in Bone's case, we had just wiped them at C. We knew they were going to be at A. He saw the radar ping. And so what, you know, no shade of Bones, but what we really could have used at that situation was, hey, they're going to rotate outside or into toilet from C. Because in that lets the other two people know we need to meet up with bones here so that we can dictate the terms of this fight. That's what you want to do ideally. Now in comp, it's a little bit different. If you're on heavy, you need to hold that heavy. The changes coming to comp are going to be huge because it's going to put more emphasis on gunplay and team play and less on snowballing, which means to just kill over and over again with heavy. Um, but if you're playing in comp, you have to hold on to that heavy or that B point, because the the resources lost from that engagement far outweigh, you know, getting in a better position for a team fight. So, I mean, let, let's talk through this one. I'm by myself on B, team is on A, I am all by my lonesome, and we're playing comp, let's say. I, I need to keep that that heavy box, um, and let's, you know, let's say I have, um, I'm playing on my Titan, so I've got a barricade as well. If I, you know, all I have is is the radar ping that they're coming somewhere from C. I don't know if they're going all the way outside or, or through the middle. What's my position? Where am, am I setting up to wait for them? Am I pushing forward and then planning on falling back? Am I falling back off B a little bit so I, you know, I'm that much closer to my team, but I still have a, a beat on them? What what am I doing? So I think the, I think the best call is. And I'll, I'll kind of role play it, if you will, as if I were in the situation myself. So I'm, I'm you on B. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm on B. Heavy's 10 seconds. All right, they just spawn C. Okay, they're coming outside C. I need someone to push through middle. I need one person to cover me from outside A. Okay, I'm backing up in the cubby. They're jumping up. Good shot, good shot. I'm picking up heavy. All right, we're moving outside. We're going to move outside, push them through C into toilet. Okay, got it. Good kill. Let's keep pushing. That's, yeah, an, that's, that's, that's an example. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's an example of a, a flow. But what you did there that was critical in that situation was you identified where they were coming from. You either as the shot caller or aided the shot caller in identifying where your teammates needed to fill lanes to come to that fight. You backed up into Cubby on your friendly side. So if you had to disengage, you could while maintaining shotgun range on the heavy box Your teammate had the call early of the jump up and was able to pre-fire and take out that jump up onto B, which then gave you a 3v2, which is 33% more firepower than the other team has, and you were able to take that heavy and go. I'd like to picture birds doing that exact call-out series, but solo queuing and and talking to no one. And like (laughs) his wife coming in and be like, who are you talking to? Just (laughs) talking to my cat. (laughs) Uh, okay no that's uh there there was a lot covered in in those call outs there (sighs) okay so where's where's the next place to head i think the the two things i'm really i'm really curious about and uh you tell me which one is the the most important one to cover first sure um you talk about these these positions right we've got points of dominance we've got pivot positions 
Um, either I kind of talk me through the math of that for what's going through to a good position, but I also want to know about team comp, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I want to know more specifically how, how to best roll as a team. Sure. Before, before I jump into that, I do want to, if I may pull in Lord Swain here of Gambit real quick, because Gambit is a great example of this mindset at play as well. Because I know there are some folks that perhaps might be more PVE inclined, but they're interested in getting better in PVP. <laughs> so very briefly, before I answer your question, if I may, Gambit is a great example to practice this in because there's a mm-hmm. PVE element. So there's a there's more time to get used to making the right callouts. Because what you want to get used to is taking in information quickly, analyzing it, and getting it back out quickly to achieve an effect. So, and, and Swain can speak to it. He's Dredgen Lord, Queensbreaker extraordinaire. You know, he can, he can relate to it through Gambit, but there is that piece too in other game modes. I just wanted to throw that out there very quickly before we transition. Gambit is mostly uh, three locations over and over and over again in the same match. And there is only <laughs> three, uh, well, most maps, there's only three spawns for an invader. So, Having those three locations, same enemies, like same predictable like motion every single time, makes it really easy to repeat callouts and to get familiar with callouts because you can be like, oh, that's steps because he literally says at steps, <laughs> so yep. you don't even really need to be focused on your radar to know where you are. The you know he's actually calling out where things are coming from, so. Um, I think, yeah, I think Gambit's a great place to kind of get familiar with, like, figuring out your callouts and that, like, flow from parts of the map to other parts of the map. The best way to get there is, like, another part of it is, like, oh, there's a there's a portal here, or are we going to try and, you know, go from cover to cover because there's an invader? Like, there's a lot mm-hmm. to it. I was going to say, before I play comp, I like to warm up with Gambit. Um, we have a guy in the clan who got 88 guardian defeats in a gambit game. 88. <laughs> I mean, and I, and I say that because was he playing six v six gambit? No, <laughs> no, he was playing well one v seven because his teammates weren't helping him out too much. But that shows you the level of mastery of positioning that you can achieve. That to as the invader to be and as the defender too because he had to defeat the other team's invader to be in the right place at the right time. That there's it's a great game mode. I just wanted to open that up real quick because I know there's some folks that listen to the show that are, are timid to go into comp or trials when it comes back. And Gambit is such a good place because there's no elo for those that care about such things. You know, there's no nothing tied to winning. You get rewards if you win or lose. No issues. Quick place hard because of the casual nature of it. But Gambit is is a really great place to do it. So sorry, back to your original question, um, kind of where we go from here, the the math going into map callouts and whatnot. Um, so Endless Veil is a really good one to use um, in terms of defining that. And it, it's hard because it's a hard thing to do because all four people have to have the same terminology. If you're not working from the same playbook, it's not going to be useful. It's not going to bear fruit for you. Um, so, for instance, on Endless Veil, when I, I, when I approach it, if I knew that I was going to play a scrim tourney, for example, and the four maps that are typically played are Dead Cliffs, Javelin 4, Burnout, and Endless Veil. And I know Endless Veil is going to be the first map that we play. And I boot up a private match. I like to take a tour of the entire map of my team. We, we take a tour together. We talk about it. We talk about where we want to fight, where we want to uh, defeat the enemy. In the army, we call it Engagement Area Development, EA Dev. Where do we want to kill the enemy? Where do we not want the enemy to kill us? So defining at the macro level of the match, that first is crucial. Where do we want to win this match from? Right now in comp, it's where's the heavy at? But when you take that away and you're in a scrim setting and there's no heavy, it's much different. It's points of domination that set you up for success. So in this veil, the key points of domination are maintaining control of the jump up by toilet maintaining control of B on the outside, the entrances from A and C into that middle lane leading into toilet, and the cubbies. That that whole middle area, those five pieces of that middle area, open up the entire map, minus the back parts of spawns, for your team's movement. So controlling that middle area, but even more specifically than that, controlling those five points 
um, are crucial to victory. Then beyond that, when you talk about pivot points, those change because your team's position on the map will change as the match flows. What was once a pivot point for this engagement has now changed. So for example, if we're going to pivot through A cave and try to push them off of A, that is now the pivot point. And everyone needs to be able to acknowledge rapidly, yes, that is the pivot point. We're going to rotate through here. The control player is already set up, locking that down for us to pivot through that and collapse and rotate through that. Um, that has to be a very fluid thing. And familiarity, team chemistry, I love watching the BSK four stacks play because they have that level of familiarity. And there are many great teams on, on both PC and PS4, but I watch them a lot specifically uh, because they're speaking the same language when they do that. Um, and, and they just know borderline precognitive where everyone's going to be on the map to achieve the greatest effect. And that's kind of what you want to get to. So when I approach a map, that's how I try to lay out the fight, if you will. So define the fight. Where do you want to kill the enemy? Where do you not want to get killed at? Say, these are our points of domination we want to maintain control of. And then during the match, identify those lanes, those pivot points that serve as the primary route for you to get to the enemy or to whatever objective you have. So I want to uh, I want to come back to that first concept of points of domination, and I'm looking at the the endless fail map right now. Uh, if you're listening, I suggest going to crucibleradio.com and check out the maps. We got a bunch of good ones there. Those are the ones um, I use. Yeah, they're that that relic man. He's, he's something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nobody knows how he does it. Um, so you you call out these five points, but. Explain to me what it means to control them. Does controlling them mean that I'm standing on them? Does it mean that yeah, I've got a good, a good line of sight on them so I can shoot someone who comes into there? What does it look like to, to own it? That's a fabulous question, Bird. So owning something does not mean physical presence on. Owning something, depending upon your loadout, if you have a go figure with ricochet rounds, owning something can be 100 meters away. It's It just depends on what your loadout is. But it, let's say in a comp setting, mostly it's shotgun hand cannon. Really what owning it means is nobody can enter into that space without having to go through you. So on Endless Veil, for example, if you're holding a cubby looking at heavy, then you really control that entire cubby space because you're set up first. You have the advantage of placement. Um, you're not on heavy. You never want to be on heavy because there's a lot, it opens you up to a lot more angles. But you're just off of heavy controlling that space. And the moment it pops, you can jump out, grab it, pop back into your cubby, orient yourself back to the map, make call outs or work with the shot caller and rotate accordingly. Um, so it's more to the latter part of your answer than the former. It's being in a position mm -hmm. that allows you to maintain your life while also maximize your ability to do damage to enemy that enters into that space. So I wonder about the situation where, let's say we're playing Endless Veil, vale, we've got a team that, you know, pretty well set up on mid, um, and we want to challenge them for it. Is there, you know, if my team is fighting from, you know, seaside, you know, they're, they, they, they got the spawn there, they're basically looking up the hill, um, you know, is, is there value in me saying, all right, well, you know, you guys have got a fight going here. Maybe they're going to, you know, rotate around and go underneath. Um, is there value in me saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pull off a wide flank. I'm going to go all the way around the outside. I'm going to try and jump up on B. Yeah, sure. They kind of have that area, but they're going to be focused on you. Um, and now I've got a line on all of these spaces. C can I get that control from them when I'm on my own? Am I going on a suicide mission? Should we be splitting up our team maybe two and two to try and distract them? Or should I assume that they've got it covered, not just from the angle we're currently fighting at, but from every angle? Sure. So what you're, what you're actually doing is you're disrupting their control, which has just as much value as having control yourself. Not as much, but if you can disrupt the enemy's game plan, for instance, if they're on B, heavies in five, your team's nowhere in position. But you know you can slide in with a Not Forgotten, a Luna's, an Ace, maybe get a quick pick, but at a minimum force them to respond to you. You've now disrupted their game plan and what they want to do. Um, because Destiny at its highest level, much like Overwatch, much like a MOBA, it is plays and counterplays. It is making people spend resources and minimizing the spending of yours. If you can even jump up there and force them to pop a super on you, you've now created a value advantage to your team. 
Um, there's so many good infographics. When I, I watch a lot of the Smite Pro League, uh, League of Legends, their pro scene, watch a, I watch a lot of different pro scenes. The infographics are crucial to understand because you're really understanding, okay, that guy just died, but why is the commentator saying that it was a great play? Oh, because he got this thing, which gave them 3,000 more gold to buy this weapon, which is allowing their carry to do this much more damage in the next fight, which actually matters. Like That concept of being able to disrupt the enemy's game plan is just as valuable. So I would say in that situation, Birds, if you can keep your life, great. But even if you can't, if you can get a pick or at least disrupt them pulling that heavy long enough for your team to rally and get there, you're going to get two or three people looking at you because guess what? Deep inside, we're all thirsty. We all want that kill, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to get people turning to shoot at you real quick because <laughs> they, they want that kill. So, uh, I like that. I'm just writing down uh, Deep Inside, We're All Thirsty. On <laughs> Deep Inside, We're All Thirsty. It's a good show title. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a good tender right there. Um, so, maybe in a more abstract way, I mean, you mentioned those four maps that are kind of standard for scrims. Um, but, you, you know, let's say we're playing comp. We've got a larger selection of maps. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say I'm not plugged into this world. I'm trying to figure it out for myself. What makes a position good? What are, what are the characteristics of a strong position? I mean, you talk about having good angles, maybe proximity to, to the heavy box. But um, I mean, I'm just wondering if there's some characteristics. Like the one that comes to mind is like having a height advantage for one. What goes into that? So I would say the, the very first step, and we call it layer one to any situation, is the user himself or herself. You know, what is your skill set? What can you do effectively repeated over a long period of time? If it's hitting snipes, great. If it's shotgun, one of your shotgun duels, awesome. If it's consistently three tapping, those sorts of things. So let's say for the sake of argument that it's somebody that can do all three of those things. Um, what goes into a good position is, well, let's take Midtown, for example. I, I don't like Midtown because it caters to a certain passive game style, especially when it's countdown. But it's a good example of a map that has multiple spots that can become points of domination. Uh, if they are pushing outside market, to plant and you spawn kind of back by you know west tree leading into the countdown plant spot um you know you're heading out there a really good spot to be on that map is on the far outside right with angles looking at where heavy spawns on the street because you're locking down that avenue that comes along the water across the gondola you're locking that down but you're also looking through the doors and window right at heavy nobody can move into that space without having a first answer to you Another good spot is to have somebody positioned um, at the middle lane, if you will, that runs through the middle where that bridge and archway is to kind of be not on that jump up, but in vicinity of that jump up so that they can either jump up and do something or lock down that door. And then finally, uh, behind the, I can't remember what it would be now, but the, the train car looking thing that's right by outside yeah. plant, behind that, you want to have two people. One person that's looking at arch coming from rugs and one person that's looking uh, with the guy covering gondola onto that middle lane by outside heavy. What that allows you to do is you now have flexibility for about 40% of the map that once the callout's made, you know where they're coming from, you can start to what we call in the military is envelop them. You want to position yourself in such a way that limits their options. So in this case, the mm -hmm. points of domination shift. You need to decide who's going to be the hammer and who's going to be the anvil? In this case, your anvil should be the gondola and whoever's watching that middle lane with him because now the guy that's watching arch and mid lane can rotate and try to pincer that team coming from the outside. So that guy who is watching middle way arch is now moving up to that little walkway that leads down into the main alley um, that our player one, player two are watching on the street. You have someone moving there, and then you have someone wrapping all the way through rugs, almost behind them, because now you've created essentially 80%, almost 85% of map coverage by doing that. Um, it's less about a specific point, because it's dependent on where the enemy team is and where you are. It's more about conceptualizing the map in such a way that mm. you are maintaining this steady transition in response to what they're doing if you're on defense. Or if you're the stronger team, you're just running at them, taking away any and all points of domination and outslaying them. Same thought process applied differently depending upon your skill level, their skill level, where they're at on the map and time and space. 
So, so there's definitely like a sort of timing flow of the of the fights component to this. It sounds like when you kind of don't know, you know, where they're at, you haven't made contact yet, your radar hasn't gone off. What it's about is prioritizing, you know, being able to watch as many angles as possible, being able to have, you know, good beads on, you know, providing, you know, ha- having a shot on as many angles as possible, but covering that with your team so other players are not only doing the same, but they're doing it in a complementary way. So once you know where they are, the people who are watching the now empty lanes know, okay, I can, I can stop watching this thing. I can, um, I can move into a position that is supported by where my teammates already are. And then Absolutely. when you're fighting, it's just, about, it's just about the angles. It's about having them limited in options for where they can go while you're closing in. Destiny, much like chess, at the highest level. Once Chestnut, you've pos- we call it chess. Sorry, yeah, there, chess Sorry, I, that's, I like it, that. That's I'm, a good. Uh, I'm not a, writing that down. Another good show title there. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm sorry. Uh, Chestnut okay. <laughs> at its highest level. No, so Destiny at its highest level, it ends up not being about the gun skill at all because that's assumed to be there. It's about being in the best position to maximize your gun skill. Like it, it, it comes to not really having to shoot a bullet at all. If you position yourself properly and can execute. That's infinitely more important than being the best shot in the game. Now, granted, when you go against a team of equal coordination and teamwork, whoever has the better mechanical skills probably going to win, or whoever makes the better adjustments round to round or within the match itself. But it, really, in most matches, I I know the outcome of a match usually within the first minute and a half mm-hmm. because I can gauge our strength relative to their strength relative to how we're moving on the map and the level of our callouts. And so as the, as traditionally, I'm usually the shot caller on most of the teams that I'm on. Uh, I can very quickly diagnose what we need to do to either kick our game up so we don't throw, which we still do. I still do for sure. Um, or to just end it quickly because we know there's such a gap in skill level and coordination. I think there's a good segue there to that other topic. When you talked about those positions, it was in relation to other players. So in one sense, we sort of have our team of four players kind of divided into two groups, sort of pairs that are supporting each other. And one pair can all of a sudden become the flanker that's setting up the pinch. Um, But then also you have four individual players. They've all got a different set of angles they're watching that are complementary. Talk to me about how teams fit together. I mean, it's the beginning of the match we've spawned in. There's four of us. Um, You know, we know each other. We've got the same call outs. We've got some chops. What does moving into position like a team look like? Yeah, so I, I think another great way to to role play this is to kind of give you what you know what my call outs to my teammates would be. It's a little bit hard because you can't hear their responses, but usually in in high level circumstances at the beginning, much like a quarterback, you want silence. You want that person calling the play and setting it up. And then once the play is actually happening, that's where the communication comes in. So let's let's stick with the midtown example here. Countdown being the game mode. Um, we're now on offense. All right, so we spawn in. Okay, all right, let's go for a snap plant and rugs. I'm going to push up. I'm going to tighten skate in, get the quick plant. I want one person on jump up in middle lane. I want one person underneath him. Then let me get somebody watching the middle lane that can flex to me if they push. All right, we're moving in. All right, I got the plant. I'm putting up titan shield. Okay, they're, ro- they're trying to rotate through middle. All right, I'm going to back up and take away Arch so they can't come back through there. All right, we got somebody on jump up and on top. Okay, let's get that engagement. All right, good shots. All right, I'm running behind him. I'm collapsing. Good pick, good pick. Push this last one, team wipe. Got him. All right, good round. So you said, I want one person here. I want one person there. If you're in an actual match, are you telling individual people what to do? Is the expectation that they'll kind of know, oh, I... I see someone else moving there. I'll take this other one. How does that shake out in practice? Yeah, so, it, I mean, a lot of it's just knowing your people. Um, a lot of it's leadership style. I tend to take a more directive approach um, than some teams. Some teams, like, there's a lot of just phenomenal slayers that'll win purely off of having four people with just raw skill. They really don't have to coordinate. They understand a lot of these concepts, um, but they just slay out better. So that that's kind of... That's kind of a trump card in all these situations, but I would say vast majority of the time, um, all things being equal, whoever has a better strategy, the better macro game is going to win. Um, so for my approach, 
I do on certain maps, especially countdown, give specific locations. And the reason I do it is twofold. One, because it, it allows us to all hear actively what one person's thinking and respond to it verbally. So it's, it's getting the thought out there on the table so that everybody can provide very quick input or say, no, 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 scratch that. I have Sentinel up. I'm pushing through middle. All three of you go through rugs and we're going to pincer them. Like just verbalizing and making a play that might get accepted or not by the team is crucial. The other piece is you now know where everyone is set at the onset of that engagement so that when, when things start hitting the fan, you kind of know where people are in time and space. Because when you're aiming down sights and you're in that gunfight, you don't have, you can't look at the map. You don't have time to look at your left or right. You have to trust that that person's going to be there. And again, better do the wrong thing together than be individually brilliant. Because at least I know I've got one person on top ridge, one person in the door underneath him, and one person hanging out in the, in the, in the fish shop in the back where I can rotate through. So if we had to, if we had to, if they got to rugs first, we have a way to rotate back through tree, back into our spawn, and get back onto street and reset if we had to. Um, like I said, some teams don't need that level of direction and, and, uh, and calling out um, because it just went off of pure talent. But for a lot of teams, especially in Destiny, it helps um, because a lot of people just don't approach it that way. So having one person kind of dictate the pacing really helps a lot of people because then they can focus on slaying and it gets their mind off of worrying about the macro. I think that's also like, ideally, you want to do less call outs. And that comes with playing uh, with teammates you know very well, uh, who you can trust skill wise and stuff like that. But I think part of that call out like, is ideally or theoretically working up to that point. Because, I mean, there, there have been comp games. And, and just for example, I mean, Cap, guys from your clan, uh, there's guys like Eclipse and, and Fierce who, who can play silently. Mm -hmm. Because like they, can, they are just in the right spots. They know what the other player does style-wise. They know that they know the game. And you can literally watch you know, those two guys just go off, always support each other, always get the team shots, always get the cleanup kills, and always get the flanks. And the timing is all there. And that's, you know, the dream, but like at the same time, they're all uh, equally skilled enough to, to speak that out loud for me example, you know, I don't play with those guys a whole lot. And so I know I'm theoretically what I'm supposed to be doing, but it's amazing to just have it be narrated out to you. And then if you can actually work like that and, you know, actually take instruction from over the players, that's, a, a, <laughs> it's a tough thing for players to not be the guy who's right individually, you know, they just mm -hmm. want to do what they do. But if you can actually be receptive to that, uh, you, you know, it has propelled me to a, a higher level of play for sure in the last few months, just grinding comp like that. One of the things we try to do in Adept is we try to reach out to any community members, but specifically some of the other community members, you know, that, that are wanting to get into comp, but perhaps don't have people of comparable skill or enough to support that. And so we've been playing a lot with Clintus Gaming, um, with, uh, we played with Lulu Soccer, um, I played with Tier 1 Riot back in Season 3, which was a blast. He, he carried me. He's a great player <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a phenomenal human being. Absolutely phenomenal human being. Um, but specifically, Lulu Soccer said something to that effect of what you just said, Bones, that I really appreciated. Um, after we were done, she said, it was so helpful to have somebody just make the call and dictate because what it allowed <laughs> me to do it allowed me to contribute. I could focus on just slaying and shooting my gun while learning to, to achieve a better effect. And she's a good player. Again, somebody who would, would never speak for on her own behalf, but she's a good PvP player um, on PC as well. So, it, you know, it's, it's encouraging to hear that sort of thing because what that, what that does, that, that level of knowing yourself, of knowing that, hey, sometimes it's just better to be in receive mode. When I, I get carried through raids by my clan, Sometimes too, you know, I get carried through a comp match where I'm tired. And I'm just, I'm not feeling the shot call mood and someone else does it fierce. You mentioned him. He's a great player. One of the things I'm mm -hmm. trying to work with him on is his shot calling because he has a very, uh, in a good way, a dominant personality and has a good effect on the team chemistry and environment. So it's taking that skill and harnessing it, um, in such a way that allows for play calling fluid play calling, even mid match. You know, even such a simple thing as saying we're collapsing, 
right now, this direction can turn, turn a fight. Um, so, you know, just like you said, you want to get to that point where there's less call outs and comms are clear, but I think there will always be a place for establishing the play firsthand. Uh, because just mm-hmm. that mental process, verbalizing it to everybody else, sets expectations, gets everyone on the same playing field, and then the match becomes about who adjusts better off of that initial set. Because if you win the first fight, there's really not much to the rest of the match. You're just trying to constantly rotate to where they are, taking away points of domination, and continuing to slay them until one of two things happens. You slay them the entire match and it's over, or they respond and now you have to counterplay them. So a couple things are true. If you are trying to start a band, finding a good singer is hard to do. If you've got a group project at school or at work, finding a good coordinator is hard to do. If you're trying to put together a comp team, finding a good shot caller is hard to do. Tell me, like this, this to me is is. I, I mean, it's it's one of the it's one of the pinnacle skills of this game. Um, if you if you're someone who's looking to to step into that shot caller role maybe for the first time and i don't know if this is something that we've ever really talked about on the show i mean you have to be a solid player for sure you have to have a very good sense of the map um your your team's abilities and just you know how the given game mode tends to play out you know what the common plays are you have to know all that stuff but let's say you do what does how do you develop that skill? What are the steps? What do you practice? What do you what do you work on to try and get better on that aside from just, you know, logging enough hours that eventually you figure it out? I mean, that's a great question. You guys had sports psych Steve on feels like forever ago. That another phenomenal person um, who brought up the book uh, by Carol Dweck Mindset. And you know, it's a really good book. It's it's not the end all be all of psychology as applied to success. But it's, it's a good starting point because in that book, it kind of talks about the requirements um, for success. What goes into a successful mindset? In the same way, what goes into building a successful shot caller, really first and foremost, is trust. Um, my clan will probably laugh if they listen to this because I'm not the best at this all the time. There are times where I get tilted or I expect way too much of them or way too much of myself. And I'm just a vocal, blunt person, not always my best trait. And I'll and I'll kind of get on to people sometimes. And they'll come to me afterwards and be like, hey, man, you know, just kind of bring it back a bit. And I think that's a key point is you have to be humble to accept correction. You have to be humble to not always think you're right or to be able to say that you did something wrong. I think that's the cornerstone to being a successful shot caller is you have to be a good follower. You have to be able to know when your shots are bad. And when they're good, and you have to be able to take that step back, build that trust. If they don't trust you, they're not going to listen to you. They will not. They will go off and try to slay. They'll try to do their own thing, create their own angles, and it falls apart. And at that point, you're just playing quick play, but glory points are on the line. Um, so it starts with trust. Beyond that, it's verbalization. I like to consider myself in my job a bit of a wordsmith, someone that tries to have a robust vocabulary, uh, but pairs that with a deep analysis and an ability to look at the situation and quickly come to a conclusion. It might not be the best, but I can quickly come to an 80 or 90% solution of what's happening and then quickly develop a counteraction or a reaction to that. Um, And I think beyond that level, it really goes to motivation. How am I going to motivate my team to achieve that? And this, this is, these are life lessons, guys. This is not just destiny. This applies to everything, every leadership aspect, because shot calling is just another form of leadership as applied to gaming. Um, that, that very pinnacle is motivating that team to achieve higher than they could on their own. Someone gets that sniper pick, good play, good play, huge. Uh, you, that momentum, that positive energy, that motivation, I feed on that. When Fierce gets a great shotgun rush and gets a double or triple down, I am hyped. We are we are loving that moment. We're we're playing off that positive energy and we're using it to fuel our follow-on movements. Now we're having fun while playing at a high level. Um, and I think finding the right people, wrapping back to point one, which is trust, is crucial to that. Um, you want to have a good time. You want to slay well, but it has to be with the right people. Um, 
And and even if it's not, all the steps still apply. Brief example, did some pickup gambit with some random guys off of LFG last night. And again, I'm not I'm not the best player, but this is this is usually Swain knows random playing with random blueberries is, is heart wrenching. So I played with a group. <laughs> my 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 soul was ripped out and bleeding on the keyboard after the match. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna invite all three of them in because they were commenting that I had the unbroken title. They're like, oh wow, how'd you get that? I'm like, well, I played some comp. I'm like some comp? I played a little bit of comp. <laughs> so I invited them in. I dabble. They came in. Um, I said, hey guys. I'd love to play some Gambit with y'all and see what we can achieve as a team. I said, sure, let's do it. We had we some time for a few matches. By the end of those three matches, I was able, and this isn't to hype me up, this is them. We were able to come to an understanding of what the macro game of Gambit looks like, how to set ourselves up for success, loadouts, how to respond to an invader, how to set up for a proper burn phase or melt of the boss, how to mitigate invader spawns, how to utilize mechanics such as taking armaments or things like that to arm ourselves for invasions. Um, And they stepped away from that. And to a man, they said, wow, I have never played Gambit applying that kind of a mindset before. And two of them have messaged me since then and said, that has transformed how I'm approaching the competitive side to destiny. Now we've created longevity. Hmm. We've created incentive in what a lot of people call, quote unquote, a dead game, which I don't buy for a second. But quote unquote in a dead game, now we've increased the end game for somebody because now they're chasing not only material things like loot, armor, weapons, titles. Now they're chasing individual skill and a better understanding of the game itself. That's a very rewarding feeling. That's what we try to do in adept with the boot camps when we're in comp and we're playing with people. We want to achieve higher, better with each other, but it starts with trust. Has to build trust. Has to have humility has to be able to follow when to follow and lead when you have to lead. Oh. Sorry, that, that's a long answer. I apologize, <laughs> but I wanted to be comprehensive with that. Cap, how do you Perfect. particularly pull someone who you see potential in like that, like maybe one of those three uh, playing Gambit? Mm-hmm. Uh, what if one of them is like tilting out of this world? Yeah. How, how do you pull someone like that back and get them into that mindset mm-hmm. that focuses on that longevity game, like how improvement over blame. Well, usually it's me and comp and I got my buddy named Houndstooth who's <laughs> Houndstooth's grabbing me by the neck saying, bro, calm down. <laughs> usually it's me. I'm getting too hyped for my own good. But no, it's a, it's a great question. I think handling tilt, that, that is a skill set in and of itself. You could do a podcast, a whole episode on mitigating, handling, responding to tilt. Um, it's, it's, it's prevalent, especially given the sandbox that we have right now. There's a lot of, um, what do they call it in, uh, in wow, interesting use of game mechanics or something, basically (laughs) breaking the game. Right. Um, but said in a nice way, there's a, there's a lot of that. So I think the way you have to handle it is privately, never publicly. You start out with going to that person individually. Say, hey, man, I understand this is frustrating you. I get it. I get it. Ursa Furiosa's drives me up a wall when I should be killing him, and they come back with another full super. Or Gwen's Invest. You know, I get it. The guy's staying alive for 17-plus kills, even though Bungie nerfed it and capped it at 10. He's still getting 17-plus kills. I get it. I think it's establishing one connection with that person. A, a shared pain is better than an individual pain. Um, coming back from that, I think it's, okay, hey, got it. That stinks. How do we mitigate it going forward? Because if we want to win this match, we can't just cry about Gwen's Invest. Maybe you switch to Nova Bomb, and maybe your one job is to hold on to Nova Bomb until he pops his Gwen's Invest super, and you shut it down. Boom. Now we've just created a a positive outlet for this person to try to do something constructive against an interesting use of game mechanics um, going forward. Um, In the extreme cases where someone's just being openly toxic, you just can't talk to that person, uh, unfortunately, in that in the moment. If there's somebody you know or trust, you talk to them afterwards, much like people uh, have helped me in the past where I'm getting really kind of fired up and a bit too critical of those around me and not self-critical enough of what I'm doing wrong. Usually it has to happen after the match where they take you to the side and say, hey, you know you were wrong, right? Yeah, I know it. But if it's someone that's just not able to learn and see themselves, there's really not much you can do for that person because they don't have enough self-awareness, one, to admit they're wrong, 
two, to admit that you're right, and three, to do something about it. And that's just hard. At, at that point, you just have oh. to kind of stop it. <laughs> Man, I, I fancy myself as being decent with bullet points, but you just fucking gutted me with those bullet points. Sorry. <laughs> Put it in a spreadsheet, birds. Yeah, yeah throw it in a spreadsheet. You deal Write with it, it down. Hey, you don't get to say that. Uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> twitter.com slash famous birds pinned to the top of my profile. Very useful spreadsheet oh right there. Oh, my God. Shameless plug. Got to get Barely it Barely got it in there. Gotta Barely got it, it in there. there. <laughs> 11th hour. <laughs> yeah, you didn't think hey, I was going to do it. I've been making Overwatch references this whole time. I'm pretty sure that jar is getting pretty full, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah, just Venmo me $4 uh, at you. the end of this recording, and we'll be good. Yeah, I'm breaking out my wallet That'll right now. Me. <laughs> oh. Cap, uh, I feel okay. like we are we are scratching the surface. There's entire categories of things I think we could spend an hour talking about that we like literally did not even touch on, did not name a single specific. Um, but I think you've given us plenty to work with here. I mean, just that just that idea that we're all just one or two matches away from having a game that totally changes how we view destiny going forward. And maybe you don't always remember it. Maybe you can't always get there, but that idea that there's a whole other game lurking underneath the one that you're playing. um, I I think it's, it's one of those things you don't, you don't really believe it or you, you don't really buy it until you've experienced it for yourself. And then once it's happened, you you can't you know you can't ever forget about it. You, you can't you know maybe you can't always get there, but but you can always you, you know that it's there, and that um if you're willing to kind of elevate how you think about the game, that there's there's a lot more to it. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And and to feed off of that, I mean that just that applies to life itself, like how yeah. you how you create your own fun. Like a lot of people are down on Destiny right now, and. And it is a hard time because, you know, the, the demographic of rising gamers that didn't grow up with Halo, they're playing Fortnite, they're playing Call of Duty, they're playing other things. Our demographic, the kids that grew up playing Halo, well, they're getting older. Time's getting scarce. So Bungie's got an interesting problem set. How do they capture this newer, growing audience that doesn't have this nostalgic Halo attachment to them while maintaining true to its roots and not going Destiny BR, it's it's a challenging process. But what I think games like Destiny and 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 games that focus on these deeper mechanics will always have as an advantage is that level of of uh, depth to them. Um, because I mm-hmm. I've been I don't know how I did this, but I played over three thousand four thousand matches of PvP in year one of Destiny two. I. <laughs> people call me crazy. I'm like, guys, I love this game. I have 110 flawlesses because I just loved the depth that was in trials, playing with a set team, seeing how high we could achieve, um, and not just winning. I was more hyped for big plays that showed our skill cap at its highest level than I was for the overall win because it showed just how much further we could go and how much more there was to chase. So I would say to anybody that's getting into Destiny or wants to get into that deeper side of things, it's it's what your chase is. If your chase is for the next shiny or another, you know, new shotgun or whatever, that's great. That's that is good investment. What's deeper investment is what are you going to do with that? How are you going to maximize your use of that? How are you as a player, given your limited game time, your limited resources, perform the very best that you can? For some people, that's not a driving force, but for folks like me and others. It absolutely adds a whole nother depth to anything you do in life when you're striving to achieve the best that you can. Mm-hmm. Well, Cap, thank you for imparting this wisdom. Hey, you guys are welcome. Uh, we've got we've got uh, uh, some big changes actually coming coming next uh, next month. I guess if we had one final thing you could say, I mean, what do you predict for this game very soon or far off? I mean, where do you see Destiny going? Yeah, so I really like this question. I wrote down a big note and circled it. I'm like, I hope we touch on this. And I, <laughs> I will try to be succinct. I apologize. I have the gift of gab. So if you got to like give me the cut it off signal, yeah, just, just let me hold know. up a red light in the yeah, back just of let the me know. room. But, yeah, yeah, three out. seconds. Yeah. Okay, That's Andrew's problem. here we go. In, <laughs> in uh, 10 minutes or less, I swear. No. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> so I think if I may be slightly critical of the game we all love, I think it suffered from the very beginning from a lack 
of dedicated vision. I don't think we, not us as a community, we as lovers of the game have ever defined or the developers defined this is what destiny is. It feels like every year since its release, we're getting closer and closer to defining what destiny is. And I'm okay with that because I'm a journey guy. I'm with a, I'm in Bungie for the long haul. I want to see where this thing is at the end of 10 years because that's destiny. We were essentially in beta all of Destiny 1 leading up to Destiny 2, which then served as kind of another beta for now what we're actually getting in Forsaken, which I see as a more complete game. And that's that's critical of, of Bungie, a little bit of my opinion, um, in terms of you know vision. But I think we've solidified now. I think they've kind of are landing near what they want their vision to be going forward. So to zoom back into more specifically your question, I think going forward, they want to cater more to the to the hardcore side. They want to have avenues for the casual person to come in and enjoy it, but they know that monetization-wise, you're not going to monetize off of a casual player base. You're going to monetize off of a hardcore player base. Um, so I think going forward, I think we're going to see a lot more focus on endgame, much like Black Armory is showing us, which I personally think was a great release. I think there's a lot of articles and stuff that came out day one saying, well, this <laughs> is this is how it's rated. I don't know how you can do that with a game that has a 10-year lifespan and multi, multiple releases within it. Um, I don't know how you can come out and say definitively this is what Destiny is, because I don't think they know what the uh, end state of Destiny is yet. I think we're on this journey together, which is incredible, the level of, of feedback that Bungie does take in if you really sit back and look at it. And it's incredible to think how they've implemented and iterated based off our feedback. Um, but specifically, probably the question you're asking is going forward, what's the meta looking like? What's comp going to look like next <laughs> season? What do I use? Yeah, what do you use? Um, <laughs> I think that the heavy changes is phenomenal. That's going to force more gunfights. It's going to yeah. force teams to not snowball as hard. But if, if you are snowballing, you're doing it off of gun skill, not off of heavy skill. Um, I think that's huge. I think that's great for the game. I think they need to scale back a lot of the super exotics. Um, they briefly talked about One-Eyed Mask. Um, that I agree with Cammy Cakes 100%. Something that powerful, being behind an RNG wall, is kind of crazy to me because it dynamically changes a gunfight. Um, we play around it with with the mantra of, we'll just kill him first before he kills you. But if you give that to somebody like, um, oh goodness, who mains Titan? If you give that to Elusive of BSK, the best Titan on PC, hands down, he's not going to die. That <laughs> He's going to outslay you. Like it, pure, it Purely based off of one, his natural skill, but two, a phenomenal exotic. Things like Ursa's, um, Gwensin, Shards, things like that that give you such high reward for such little risk. I think that needs to change a little bit. Um, but I think going forward, I think you're going to see a lot more gunfights. I think you're going to see a lot of more premium on snipers for that reason. Because there's going to be less heavy. There's going to be longer gunfights. Because now you're not fighting every minute for a heavy box or every 45 seconds. Now you're fighting every two minutes in a 10-minute match. Um, that allows for longer, more in-depth engagements that can be decided by the quick snap of a bullet as opposed to just four shotguns jumping off a, on a heavy box. Um, so mm -hmm. I think you're going to see more intentional gameplay, um, and I think you're going to see a little bit more sniper play coming in. Uh, there's some great snipers that came out with this DLC. Uh, I don't know if they're going to completely change the meta at the very, very top. I think it's still going to be shotgun hand cannon predominantly, but the heavy changes are huge. The heavy changes are going to put a premium on teamwork mechanics and individual skill, and uh, I think that's going to be better for the game overall. But like I said, I'm with Bungie for the long haul. However they continue to iterate, however they continue to make this game better, I trust that's going to be for the best because they, they play this game, believe it or not. Um, they like this game too. Uh, and it's a 10-year journey. You know, To expect the finished product in year four going into year five is, is a bit premature. So I'm excited to see where it goes. It's going to be a good season. A lot of people are going to be get, getting there on Brokens this next season, so that'll be kind of fun because not a lot of people played comp in season three. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be a good one. Yeah. Well, Cap, where can our listeners find you, find your clan, find more about uh, getting into the boot camp? Sure. So um, 
unlike most people, I don't stream. Um, I, I don't ever have the time to do it. I, I devote a lot of my time to my family, my job, and what's left over, I kind of give to gaming when I can. Um, but if you were looking for me, uh, it's at cap underscore TTV on Twitter. Um, and then my Discord is cap2949. I know it's dangerous giving that out there, but I'm, I'm really good at blocking people. Um, <laughs> and then Clan Adept. Uh, we use a stylized A from the Swedish alphabet. So technically, according to my EU brothers, it's Woodept. So Woot. Um, <laughs> that sounds yeah, cool. Woodept. Woot, Woodept. Um, <laughs> but you can find us on Discord. Um, you can find us on Bungie.net with that stylized A. Um, the Discord's open to anybody and everybody as long as you follow the Discord rules. We want, again, my because of my background and knowing just a lot of people, I did time, I, I played in Destined, I played in Double Tap Mafia, I've played on a lot of the clans on PC, so I've just met people over time. My desire has always been to create a crossroads of, of skill and desire to learn. And that's what we do at Adept. So if, if anybody and everybody wants to come and be a part of boot camp, learn, get better with some great players, then that is what it's for. And then for the for those that want to take it to the next level, next level, clan membership and shooting for that is something we do by referral only. So you got to be referred by an existing member. Um, but after that, we play with you and we care more about who you are as a person than your stats and how well you fit in with us. So that's where you can find us. Hell yeah. Right on. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This has been awesome. Amazing. It's Great it's talk. my privilege. I respect everything y'all do here. Uh, you guys are just phenomenal to keep this going through the lean years uh, as well as the good years. <laughs> um, nothing but respect for what you guys do, what you bring to the community, and nothing but respect for the previous guests you've had on this show. Just a highest quality. So I'm proud and glad to be here. Yeah, we are the grizzled old men of the Destiny world at this point, but we're still here. We got some Can't kind of worm us. in our brain. Keep making us do the show. Yeah, you got to keep feeding your worm wherever Bife is. He's hearing this. He's like, got to keep feeding that worm. That's how it yeah. goes, dude. Thanks so much. This has been a blast. And um, I clearly, if this if it wasn't obvious already, this ain't over. There's this is this There's is not the last time. So we're much more to this talk about. Over. So much more. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm guessing this is the outro. You have made it to the uh, end of the episode, and <clears throat> yeah. you wonder what it's like to be a professional podcaster. We don't know either. Uh, very curious. Please let us know. I'd like to, I w- is there a book? Is there a book on it? You read a, a podcasting book? I don't know. That's kind of your thing, man. I just read fiction. Um. Hey, uh, I got. I got. I got plugs. Oh dear. I got plugs. <laughs> I both, you got some plugs? Plug it. No one listens to the end of these episodes anyway, so whatever. But hey, go listen to Gaming in Hell, my other podcast. Guess what? Mr. Birds here was just on it. We had a oh, very yeah. good talk about some serious shit. Uh, I think it connected with a lot of people, and it was very fun, as serious as it was. It was a good time, and we're doing a bunch of fun stuff for the month of December and the holidays, so go listen. And also, um, This is going to be great because I know there's going to be like one person that listens to this and tweets at me about it and that'll get me really hyped. Um, But if you have you heard of the band called Double Experience? They're very good. But um, yeah, we've got a little project in the works. Once my throat fully heals, it's going to blow your goddamn minds. (gasps) And I won't say anything more about it. CrucibleRadio.com. We got a new mug by the Christmas mug. It's adorable. My girlfriend designed it. She's incredible. And it's very, very cool. And it's a it's a Christmas list of all the things we wish we could have in Destiny. Or, you know, I have some of those things. But Support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Crucible Radio. we got to pay Andrew somehow. He doesn't like being paid in fish. I know. He's very upset with the last shipment. <laughs> <laughs> he was on tour. He didn't get home for a week and a half. It was just <laughs> sitting on his porch. I mean, he's still going to eat him. But he's right. so happy much about sturgeon. It. Not... <laughs> thrilled oh man that was a good interview thank you everyone so much for listening if you're still listening at this point then i mean you in particular you know who you're almost to your next podcast whatever that is we can only guess what you have queued up yeah hey go listen to that gaming in hell episode uh shameless promotion aside uh that was a really great conversation i was really uh i was really happy to participate in that i like it so 
Meh, 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 meh. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>